currently chair of CND, uh, see what happens tomorrow. Uh, um, thank you for coming, uh, good crowd. I hope you can see and hear okay. We've got a fantastic uh, day lined up for you. Um, this must be one of the most positive kind of starts to a conference we've had, really, considering what's happened in the last few months. So um, we've set the scene uh, in a fantastic way. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'll just make a few announcements uh, before we start. Uh, at 2 o'clock, there will be a fire alarm ringing. But, but don't worry, there won't, hopefully there won't be a fire. It's just a test. So the less people around you come and try and usher you out, uh, it's okay. If there is a fire, then the fire exits are upstairs through the main entrance where you probably came in. Um, Toilets are on the left hand side, maybe you've seen those already, and there's another lot right through to the end of, of the corridor there. Uh, we must apologise about the tea and coffee, I think a lot of you are a bit disappointed about the lack of tea and coffee on the premises, but there are plenty of places around, and you should have a sheet which tells you where the nearest places are, where some nearest places are. Uh, if you haven't got one of those, then you can get one from the table just outside. Could so, we have water available? Uh, um, we'll, we'll try. I'll see what we can do. Yeah. Um, I think that's all the messages. Uh, this place has a fantastic history. The profits for this go to help me homeless, I think. Uh, um, so it's a really good place to be. Uh, there are plaques, pla pla uh, not plaques, um, uh, pictures and, and details about some of the history of the building outside there. Also, the manager, the centre manager, Yusuf, saw one of our vice chairs, a uh, vice president, rather, who used to be a vice chair, uh, in the street, um, uh, Jeremy Gordon, of course, uh, who happened to be passing, and he sent his best wishes and said, peace, apparently, uh, from Jezza, apparently, he said. So that's a nice message to start with, I think. So, um, you have in front of you the agenda for today. Um, the first uh, four speakers are people who many of you will recognize or know about uh, anyway. The order we're going to start with, first of all, we're going to start with Joseph Gerson, who's very well known to probably an awful lot of you from the United States, the American Trade and Service Committee. He's been a fantastic international traveler and speaker on behalf of peace and justice issues around the world, focusing quite a lot on Asia and the things that are going on in Japan and around that region. Extremely knowledgeable, very insightful, and knows a lot about the peace movement uh, as it is in the United States. So, can we welcome Joseph? Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? I have to, uh, can you hear me now in the back? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Dave, for that uh, very generous um, introduction. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kate for the opportunity to join and to uh, learn from people in this year's conference. Uh, in each of our countries, uh, we have disastrous leaders in power. Uh, but with its imperial power, its arsenals, and its disregard for the rule of law, and with a man described by his Secretary of State as a fucking moron, if the moment, <laughs> Trump and his coterie are far and away the most dangerous. Another difference is that you have Jeremy Corbyn. What did we had in the US such a far-sighted moral figure leading the opposition and on the verge of taking power? Instead, we have credible reports of a suicide pact between Secretary Mattis, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, and Secretary of State Tillerson, and possibly Chief of Staff Kelly, in which all would quit the administration if the President fired any one of them. I also want to acknowledge my debt to CND over and above this uh, belt buckle uh, that I've been wearing since I became a Vietnam era draft resistor in the 70s. In the mid-70s, Peggy Duff, formerly CND's first general secretary, took me under her wing exposing me to people and ideas and political forces that have informed my life's journey. CND gave me the 
privilege of meeting and learning from Bruce Kent, Tony Benn, Jeremy Corbin, and Kate and Dave Webb have been important partners in the Peace and Planet Network's mobilizations and conferences over the past decade. Kate has asked me to speak about Trump and the Ban Treaty. So beginning with Trump, uh, the U.S., as you are well aware, is rapidly becoming a rogue state, a militarized, nuclear-armed banana republic, a plutocracy led by cruel white supremacists. Nearly every day we are assaulted by Trump and company's racist actions and policy pronouncements, and by new outrages by the fascist forces that they have unleashed. What passed for our democracy is besieged daily by their lies and attacks on free speech, the press, and truth in Orwellian fashion. The, the rule of law and what remains of our social safety net are being undermined. We have daily manifestations of the president's ignorance, his and his family's conflicts of interest, and new revelations from investigations into his and his campaign's ties to Russian oligarchs and Russian interventions into the fabric of our political system. The problem is not limited to Trump. It is systemic and a legacy of slavery, racism, and violence that endure in our national culture and strictures of our Constitution, as well as in neoliberal restructuring of our society. We see these in the rise of the extreme right-wing oligarchs like the Cox, Sheldon Adelson, and the Mercer family, who have funded right-wing supremacist institutions and the Tea Party, which are now the dominant forces in the Republican Party. They have bought local, state, and congr congressional and presidential elections. More, as David, as David Remick described in The New Yorker about our crisis, Republican and business leaders, as well as a raft of White House advisors, cannot fail to see the chaos, the incompetence, and the potential illegality. And yet they are going supporting, excusing, and deflecting attention from the president's behavior in order to protect their own ambitions and fortunes. Friends, in the wake of the Nazi Holocaust, we call such people good Germans. Now, even with the rise of the AFD, Germany is a more democratic society than the US. And as if our situation wasn't bad enough, Steve Bannon is preparing right-wing racist fanatics to challenge every Republican senator who will be standing for re-election next year. It's a nasty situation. Trump's war of words with Kim Jong-un and his rejection of diplomacy have created a Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion. Last week, the fool who sits in the White House Oval Office up the ante with Pyongyang all face with his declaration that, quote, only one thing will work, by which he clearly meant the military option. We also learned that back in July, he pressed his military advisors for a tenfold increase in the size of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. And as he decertifies what he terms the worst international agreement in U.S. history, the nuclear deal with Iran, we face the ironic situation of hoping that Congress will not impose, Republican Congress, will not impose new sanctions on Iran, and that the junta of generals around Trump can prevent his impulsiveness, ignorance, and need to dominate from pitching the world into still more catastrophic wars. Gail Collins spoke for many in the New York Times when she wrote that Defense Secretary Mattis is seen as, quote, a man standing between our president and Armageddon. Among the consequences of this unique Trump military alliance is the Pentagon's new ability to wage wars across the global south, essentially free from presidential oversight. U.S. military spending is about to increase by $55 billion. That's about 40 billion uh, pounds, I guess. Uh, this is more than Britain's total military budget and two-thirds of Russia's. $1.2 trillion is to be spent upgrading the U.S. nuclear arsenal and its delivery systems, including first-strike long-range standoff cruise missiles targeted primarily against China and the first-strike W-76 warhead. Like many in Eastern Europe during the Cold War, humor helps to keep our spirits alive. Congressman Liu has introduced a bill in Congress that would require the presence of a psychiatrist in the White House. <laughs> and children ask why Trump is like a Halloween pumpkin. Both are orange, both are hollow and seedy inside, and both must be thrown out by November. <laughs> Thank you.
The good news is that there is resistance. Polls tell us that most U.S. Americans don't trust Trump. Millions demonstrated in the women's and scientists' marches. The Republican campaign to remove health care for millions was defeated. More than half a million people signed a petition supporting legislation to prevent the president from initiating nuclear war on his own authority. And two days ago, the New York Times editorial supported that legislation. Hundreds of professional football players have taken the knee to protest police violence and Trump's racism. And late night television humorously deconstructs the Trump administration's hypocrisies, lies, threats, and stupidities. Turning to nuclear weapons and the ban treaty, recall that a year ago, Trump didn't know what the nuclear triad was and suggested that Japan and South Korea should become nuclear powers. He asked why we can't use nuclear weapons and threatened to use them against terrorists, which today in his mind would likely include Jim, Kim Jong-un. And he said, I can't take anything off the table. In his first conversation with Vladimir Putin, before labeling New Start, the New START Treaty a bad deal, he had to interrupt the call and ask his advisors what the treaty was. Since then, he has pledged to, quote, greatly strengthen and expand the U.S. nuclear arsenal, called for a nuclear arms race, and launched a nuclear policy review targeted against Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, while congressional forces pressed for deployment of land-based nuclear armed cruise missiles in Europe that would sink the INF Treaty. Compounding these dangers, Trump has sent uh, nuclear-capable B-1 bombers to conduct simulated nuclear attacks over Korea. And as you will recall, he humiliated his Secretary of State by tweeting that pursuing diplomacy with North Korea is, quote, a waste of time. This one, it's clear that the freeze-for-freeze freeze diplomatic option provides the path back from the nuclear brink. In the South China Sea, with increased tempo of US so-called freedom of navigation exercises, as well as others in the Black and Baltic Seas, Trump and the Pentagon have increased the danger that unintended incidents or miscalculations could escalate beyond control. Midst of all, we have the ban treaty. As we see with the announcement that ICANN will receive the Nobel Peace Prize, the treaty further stigmatizes nuclear weapons as it seeks to outlaw their use, threatened use, development, testing, production, manufacture, acquisition, possession, or stockpiling, transfer, and deployment. Its greatest potential seems to be here in Europe, if we consider England still part of Europe. <laughs> uh, I would be wrong, I could be wrong, uh, but my fear has been that like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Ban Treaty will give us one more treaty that the nuclear powers refuse to respect. Unhappily, I see two trains running in opposite directions. One races toward a nuclear weapons free world, and the other, with additional fuel uh, from North Korea's nuclear arsenal, is burning unimaginable fortunes as it speeds towards nuclear Armageddon. In addition to further stigmatizing nuclear weapons, the Ban Treaty's most important contributions may be reminding people around the world who haven't been paying attention about the imperative of nuclear weapons abolition, and it gives encouragement to people and governments around the world, like yourselves, who have long been working for a nuclear weapons free world. But the treaty will be respected as international law by only those states that sign and ratify it. All the nuclear powers boycotted the ban treaty negotiations. The US, UK, France, and Russia have all denounced it, falsely claiming that nuclear deterrence kept the peace for 70 years. Ask the Vietnamese, the Iraqis, the Syrians, the Yemenis, Congolese, and so many others about that. Led by the US, each of the nuclear powers is upgrading and or expanding its nuclear arsenal. With NATO's expansion to Russia's borders, something that uh, Reiner, I'm sure, will be talking about, and with the West's nuclear weapons and conventional high-tech and space weapons superiority, Moscow is upgrading its nuclear arsenal and other weapon systems. More, with increased uh, Japanese and South Korean anxieties resulting from Pyongyang's nuclear threats and growing doubts about the reliability of the U.S. nuclear umbrella, there are mounting calls from sectors of their elites for their governments to become nuclear powers. We thus could be, and I'd say we are, but we could be entering an era of nuclear weapons prolifer proliferation uh, rather than abolition. Friends, our future depends on how people and governments respond. And it dictates, I believe, a global division of labor among nuclear weapons abolitionists. 
Nations that negotiated the Ban Treaty obviously must sign and ratify it as quickly as possible, and they can do more. As Zia Mian reminded us, Article 12 of the treaty requires states' parties to treaty commitments, quote, part of their political engagement with the nuclear weapon states. Let me read that again. Article 12 requires states' parties to make their treaty commitments, quote, a part of their political engagement with nuclear weapon states. They can dispatch delegations to our countries to encourage them to join the treaty. They can initiate sanctions and boycotts to press the nuclear powers. If they have such courage, this may be the source of our greatest hope. By winning nuclear weapons, but winning nuclear weapons abolition still requires building mass movements within the nuclear weapon states and the umbrella states. These nations and our disarmament movements thus lie at the cutting edge of the struggle. The Ban Treaty certainly reinforces the popular understanding of the righteousness of Jeremy Corbyn's and CND's commitments uh, to a nuclear weapons free world. Imagine the global proliferations of a British decision not to fund Trident replacement. And across the channel, if just one or two NATO or other umbrella states are led by their people to reject the strictures of their nuclear alliances, they could begin to unravel the world's nuclear architecture and unleash the global disarmament dynamic. And for those of us in the nuclear weapon states, the imperative of resistance remains, beginning with preventing war with North Korea and preserving the nuclear deal with Iran. It also includes steadfast education about the human cost, preparations for, and dangers of nuclear war that can be brought on by miscalculation or accident, as well as intentionally. We need to highlight the deceit and deficiencies of deterrence and teach about the forces that led to the negotiation of the Ban Treaty. Friends, uh, on the eve of the 2010 NPT review, uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon addressed a conference that we organized, and he was very clear that governments alone will not deliver us a nuclear weapons free world. He said that will only be achieved uh, by popular power from below, by the actions of, of civil society. Uh, and turning to the US past, uh, which is part of my, my way of being, I think, uh, I want to quote uh, from uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, probably the leading 19th century anti-slavery uh, abolitionist in the United States. He said, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. We won't prevail without challenging uh, we have uh, visible and challenging nonviolent actions and mobilize uh, popular opinion. And in, in, in talking to people here before we began, I've heard about some initiatives planned here, which I think are really quite encouraging. Our best hope may lie in Jeremy Corbyn and possible Scottish succession from what was once Great Britain. Jeremy has said he will not push the nuclear button, and the loss of fast lane on the Scottish coast could leave London without a nuclear weapons base. What CND does will thus be critical for human survival and to our, uh, and to our struggles in the other nuclear weapons and umbrella states. Friends, I want to close by invoking the words of another Nobel Peace Laureate, Joseph Rothblatt, uh, the only Manhattan Project senior scientist who resigned uh, out of moral considerations. Years ago in Hiroshima, he said that humanity faces a stark choice. We can either completely eliminate the world's nuclear weapons or we will see their global proliferation and the nuclear wars that will follow. Because no nation will long tolerate what it experiences as an unjust hierarchy of power, in this case, nuclear terror. We will together make our road to a nuclear weapons free world by walking it. Through our actions, we can and must build on the ban treaty and take advantage of nuclear disarmament openings that we find and that we create. With vision, courage, and steadfastness, we shall overcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent, guys. Excellent.